Concentration is something you do. You focus your attention on a breath. Try to breathe in a way that's comfortable. Then you try to spread that comfort so it, that it fills the body, so your sense of the breath fills the body, and your awareness fills the body. You want all these three things to come together, each filling the other or the others. That's the world of your concentration. And it's always important to remember that it is something that you're doing. Because there are times when you can get with a sense of awareness filling everything. And it seems like the, the awareness is not affected by anything. Those meditation methods that tell you that you get in touch with the ground being, the awareness that embraces everything, as if that were a ground being. Or having you forget the fact that your awareness is something that's fabricated, something you put together intentionally. And if you don't see that it's something you put together, you can misunderstand your concentration. Because it is a state of becoming. Becoming comes from clinging, desire, craving. But we're taking these things and we're using them for the sake of the path. This is where the Buddha's strategic approach is important to appreciate. I know some people who say that we shouldn't be doing concentration because if you do concentration you have to have a sense of self that's going to be doing it and it's going to be benefiting from it. And so you should simply allow the mind to wander as it likes. But that's also stating, creating a state of becoming, one in which there is no self or at least nobody responsible. And it certainly doesn't create the path. The path is something you have to put together, it's something you have to fabricate. It is a sankhara in Pali, a fabrication. And it requires desire. That's part of right effort. So put it together with this desire, so that you have a state of becoming that you can that allows you to watch other states of becoming as they come in. You see the mind tempted to go off into a into a distraction of some kind, and you begin to see the steps. This. First, a little curiosity. There's a potential here. And then we have the idea we can do something with that potential. As the Buddha says, we fabricate feelings for the sake of feelingness and perceptions for the sake of perceptionness or perceptionhood. It's very strange Pali, turning all these things into abstract nouns. But the important part is that for the sake of. There's an intentional element going on here. And we take a potential and we turn it into something we think we can use. And it's good to be able to see those processes in action. Because there is that temptation. Once you've created something like that, you move into it, and then you forget that you created it. It's like blowing bubbles and then moving into the bubbles forgetting that you blew them to begin with. Then the world is colored by the color of the bubble, and then it breaks. And then you blow some more bubbles, then you move into those bubbles. It's good to be consciously aware that this is something that we're doing. And we're doing it all the time. Now we want to understand it, because as the Buddha said, the craving that gives rise to becoming is the craving that causes suffering. It can be sensual craving, or blatant craving for becoming, or even craving for non-becoming. As he said, one of the 
great insights he gained was seeing that even in the craving for non-becoming, there is some becoming. It can either be because you take on the identity of someone who wants to see this state of mind destroyed, or you want to take on the identity of the destroyer. In all these cases, you're going to suffer. So you want to see this in action, and concentration gives you a great place to see it. Not only watching the processes of distraction as the mind begins to wander here or wants to wander there, but also you become more conscious of how the state of concentration is itself a state of becoming and how it is put together. You see both the world that you create as you create this state of concentration and your identity in that world. Now, when the concentration is really good, really solid, and there is that sense that your awareness and the body and the feeling of pleasure permeate one another to the point of almost oneness, it seems like you and this world of concentration are one. And that too can give rise to misunderstandings. We constantly have to keep reminding ourselves that we're watching actions and their results. Because the mind tends to think in terms of beings in worlds. And as long as you think in those terms, you're going to suffer. The way out is to start thinking in terms of actions and results. Look at the Buddha's own quest. As he said, we start out bewildered by suffering and begin to realize that True knowledge would be seeing how to put an end to suffering. And who knows how many different ways he attempted to put an end to suffering, or to find the end of suffering, before he found the right way. But when he was talking in later years about his quest, he said he was in search of what was skillful. In other words, he was looking for what could be done to put an end to suffering. He framed all his questions in terms of actions and the results. If he saw that he wasn't getting the results he wanted, he would look back at his actions and ask himself, is there another way I can act? Is there another path to follow? And he saw that he could resolve his doubts by following questions that were rightly phrased. And so when he taught, he encouraged questions. He wasn't the kind of teacher who said, I'll just tell you the way things are and you have to accept it. He saw that in his own quest he had to learn how to ask the right questions, frame them in the right terms. And so he wanted to teach people how to do that as well. That was why he's so particular about the different ways he would answer questions. Some questions, as he said, deserved a categorical answer. In other words, yes, no, across the board. And those questions had to do with two things. One was the fact that unskillful behavior should be abandoned and skillful behavior, behavior should be developed. And the second was the Four Noble Truths and their duties, the duty to comprehend suffering, the duty to abandon its cause, the duty to realize cessation, and the duty to develop the path. These were the terms that framed, as he said, the ideal questions, because we're talking here about, in both cases, we're talking about actions and results. These are truths that have duties. They tell you what to do. They're not, say, like the three characteristics. If they're taken on their own, they don't have any duties. The Buddha wasn't the first to point out that things are inconstant, stressful, not self. There are a lot of hedonists who say, ah, that's the way things are. And they take a very different conclusion from that. It's because the Buddha didn't simply take the three characteristics on their own. He taught them as three perceptions, and they're to be used in the context of the Four Noble Truths to help you comprehend suffering, to help you abandon its cause. So what the Buddha was looking for was truths with duties, truths to give you a sense of what to do. 
And he, as a teacher, said that was one of his duties as a teacher, was to give his students a sense of how to figure out what should be done, what should not be done, what's skillful, what's not. So those are the main terms, what he called the categorical questions. Then there were the questions that he said deserved an analytical answer. In other words, they weren't phrased quite right, or they based on a misunderstanding, usually of karma. Like the question of, would the Buddha say anything displeasing? It was a trick question. If you said yes, then they would say, what's the difference between you and every other person in the world? If you said no, well, they had him on record for having said some displeasing things to Devadatta. They thought they had him. So when they asked him the question, would the Buddha ever say anything displeasing, he said, well, that doesn't deserve a categorical answer. It deserves an analytical answer. He stepped out of the false dichotomy. As he said, there are times when it is for the good of the other person that you say something displeasing. He gave the example of a baby that's gotten something sharp in its mouth. He says, you do what you can to get the object out, even if it means drawing blood. Because if the child kept the sharp object in its mouth, it might swallow it and do even more damage. So in the same way, there are times we said, well, it's for the other person's good that you have to say something displeasing. So that's an analytical answer. Then there's cross-questioning, a question that deserves to be cross-questioned. In other words, you ask questions back of the person, and usually it's a case where the Buddha senses that the person asking the question will not understand the answer unless he's given an analogy. from his own experience, and that he can compare that with what the Buddha is about to say. Here again, he's teaching patterns, because that's what analogies are. They, they have you look at the formal pattern and the ways in which teaching people to gain awakening and taking sharp objects out of mouths can be similar. Finally, there were the questions that the Buddha said put aside. These are the ones that were framed in terms of selves and worlds. In other words, the terms of becoming. If we're going to get out of becoming, we have to learn how to look at it, not simply as selves and worlds, but as the world as an activity, your sense of self as an activity. Your sense of the world is going to change depending on your desires. Your sense of yourself is going to change depending on your desires. So this is one of the reasons why when the Buddha was asked, is there a self or is there no self, he refused to answer. Because if you go with the idea that there is a self, there are certain defilements that are going to be developed that way, depending on how you define yourself, what you think you have to do to maintain yourself, to maintain the well-being of the self. And that can lead to some very unskillful behavior. If you say there's no self, that can lead to unskillful behavior too. Both sides can create their own defilements. So the Buddha says, try to avoid those questions. If you're going to think of self, think of your sense of self and see it as an action. See your sense of the world as an action. So when you find yourself trapped in the body, you in the world of the body, ask yourself, what is the action going on here? On the one hand, there's their perception that's creating the trouble. And there are all the various defilements that arise based on the perceptions. So always look for the actions. We get the mind in a state of concentration so we can see its own actions a lot more clearly and understand where they're causing us trouble, where they're causing us suffering and pain. And also to develop our ingenuity to see if there's some other way we can do things so that we don't have to cause us suffer 
suffer, ourselves suffering. We don't have to cause ourselves pain. So when you run into a problem, ask yourself, well, this problem I have, learn how to express it as an articulate question. And then ask yourself, if the Buddha were asked that question, what answer would he give? What kind of question would he regard it as? Would it categorical? Would it require an analytical answer? Do you have to do some more cross-questioning to figure out what's going on? Or you just put it aside? How would he have you phrase the question? All too often our problems are that we're not very clear about what our questions are. Or even if we are clear, we don't know what category they belong to, whether they, what kind of response they, they deserve. But remember, the Buddha found that asking the right questions at the right time, that's the way to awakening. And so take your questions seriously. Take the way you create questions seriously, because it can make all the difference. We've got the Buddhist example, and we've got the, in terms of his own quest, we've got his examples in terms of how he taught. And see if you can inform your own quest in your own questions in line with the example he set.